Good morning. We have general questions. Question one, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact is of EU rule changes on capital projects in central Scotland. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, I advised Parliament last week that the Office of National Statistics is seeking opinion from Eurostat on some points of clarification relating to their July decision about the classification of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route NPD project. This is likely to take some weeks. In parallel, the Scottish Futures Trust has submitted proposals to the ONS in relation to the hub model through which we are delivering a programme of schools and health projects. The ONS is likely to be in a position to respond by late October or November. As a result, I do not expect it to be possible for a number of hub projects in the current pipeline to reach financial close over the coming weeks. SFT will continue to engage closely with project partners to consider the implications for them, and the Scottish Government will, of course, keep it, the position under close review. Mark Griffin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Government approved the merger of Abernhill High School and Cumberland High School with the following condition on the local authority, and I quote, to provide the Scottish Government and the parent councils of all the schools affected by this proposal confirmation that funding had been secured for the new school, along with a detailed timetable for development and construction of the new school. Given that part of the confirmed funding for the new Cumberland Academy was provided by the Scottish Government, that it was a government condition of the merger proceeding and that the timetable is now put in doubt due to issues with the Scottish Government funding share, does the Cabinet Secretary not feel that the government has a moral obligation to provide conventional capital funding for this particular project? Cabinet Secretary. I, where I can agree with Mr Griffin is that I think the utilisation of traditional capital funding is a, a, a more straightforward route for the development of capital infrastructure. And that's why I regret so much the fact that we've had such substantial reductions in our capital budget since the 2010 United Kingdom general election, where we are, on average, uh, operating with about £1 billion less traditional capital expenditure than we had historically. So, and, and, and I think that is a much more reliable way to fund public expenditure. What we have done to... Uh, mitigate the effect of that has been to move to the, the NPD and hub models and what we are encountering are the very issues that Mr Griffin fairly raises in his question about the, um, the advice on the, uh, the, the, the ESA rules. The government is working its way through those rules. We are working uh, as diligently as we can with the Scottish Futures Trust to resolve these issues, but they are complex matters that have now been referred by the ONS to Eurostat and I can assure Parliament that I will maintain a very open dialogue with Parliament and with stakeholders about how we resolve these issues. Alison McInnes. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary has just referred to the AWPR. Does the delay in revising the contract have any impact at all on the start date for any of the sections of the work on the AWPR? It, none Secretary. whatsoever. Question two, Hugh Henry. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of reported uncertainty caused by the transition to the European System of Accounts 2010, whether it will instruct that work should start immediately on the construction of the new Barhead High School, with the Scottish Government bearing any risks in additional contracts and with contracts amended as necessary. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, as I advised Parliament last week and again in my response today to Mark Griffin, I do not expect it to be possible for a number of hub projects in the current pipeline, including Barhead High School, to reach financial close over the coming weeks while necessary engagement with the Office of National Statistics continues. The Scottish Futures Trust will engage closely with all affected project partners over the coming weeks. Hugh Henry. Uh, President Officer, the pupils, teachers and parents of Barhead High School are having to cope with a building that is frankly not fit for purpose. It is impacting on the future of these young people. Now, I understand the dilemma that the Cabinet Secretary has and the difficulties caused by this decision. But, you know, there is an old phrase, presiding officer, where there's a will, there's a way. And I'm asking if the Cabinet Secretary will show some will to say that the Scottish Government would underwrite any additional costs that will come as a result of this and instruct the SFT should engage in getting that work started immediately. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I can assure um, Mr Henry there is no absence of will on the part of the government to undertake new school developments, given that over 500 schools have either been refurbished or rebuilt under this government's term in office. And 
Uh, so the will is there to take forward these projects. What I have to do is I have to live within the resources that are available to the Scottish Government. If I had lived within only the capital allocations that were available to us, then a whole range of projects in Scotland would not have taken their course because we would not have used NPD. And that's helped to boost the construction activity within Scotland, so much so that in the, in the last 12 months, there has been a 21 per cent increase in construction activity within Scotland, which has been a fantastic contribution to our economic growth. Now, I can assure Mr Henry that this issue is at the top of my list of priorities to resolve, and there is a huge amount of effort being undertaken to try to resolve it as quickly as we possibly can do. And I will, of course, uh, advise Parliament of the progress that we make in that respect. Jack the Cabinet Secretary told Parliament previously that eight projects were delayed as a result of ESA 10. That didn't include Barhead High School, Our Lady in St Patrick's High School in my area, or Cumbernauld High School that we've heard about just now. And they're all clearly caught up in this delay. On the basis of the open dialogue that he just promised, will the Cabinet Secretary publish the full list of projects affected, given that he believes the delay will be until October or indeed November? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've, I've given comprehensive information to Parliament already in the answers I gave last week to Parliament. And I've also promised Parliament that I will make a full statement once I have more of the information to hand to give Parliament more clarity about the steps that we can take in this respect. But that, the, the provision of that clarity is not all in my hands. It is largely in the hands of the Office of National Statistics and Eurostat. So I, I reaffirm what I said to Parliament last week, that I will come to Parliament and fully update Parliament on the progress of the projects that are affected once we have a clearer sense of the way in which this issue is going to be resolved. Question number three, Cara Hilton. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it's had with NHS Fife regarding maternity services. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robert. Ministers and government officials regularly meet with representatives of NHS Fife to discuss matters of importance to local people, including maternity services. Cara Hilton. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The baby boom in my constituency of Dunfermline has clearly caught NHS planners by surprise. And at a recent NHS Fife board meeting, Scott McLean, Director of Acute Services, warned, and I quote, this has added significant pressure to maternity services and there is a real risk that the safety and effectiveness of the service could be compromised if these pre pressures are not addressed. Yet, despite this very real risk, NHS Fife have said they won't review maternity services in Dunfermline until a national review has been completed. Given that we're talking about the safety of mums and babies potentially being compromised unless action is taken swiftly, will the Cabinet Secretary support my call for an urgent root and branch review of NHS Fife maternity services to ensure they meet the needs of Dunfermline and West Five. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, can I uh, assure uh, the people of Fife that uh, the services are safe uh, for uh, their use in NHS Fife? Uh, NHS Fife have, as Cara Hilton rightly said, discussed this matter and, of course, are looking to refresh the strategy around maternity services, taking into account the increase in the Fife birth rate that Cara Hilton referred to, but also the outcome of the maternity and neonatal services in Scotland um, that is under review at the moment, uh, and also to consider the views of local service users prior uh, to taking any further action. So in the meantime, they are, not, uh, they are getting on with engaging with the local community on plans to augment antenatal and postnatal services on the Queen Margaret Hospital site. So they are getting on with that. Uh, but I will make sure that NHS Fife uh, are continuing to look at how they develop their maternity services, but I think it's right and proper that they also uh, look at what the review recommendations are from the maternity and neonatal services review that's taking place nationally. Question four, Claire Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Ministerial Advisory Group on Child Poverty last met and what matters were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, the Ministerial Advisory Group on Child Poverty met with officials on Tuesday of this week and discussed a number of issues related to child poverty in Scotland, including the ongoing Fair of Scotland conversation and a draft annual report on child poverty, which will be published later this year. The advisory group also held constructive discussions about the future approach to tackling child poverty in Scotland. Claire Adamson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Well, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the UK Government has abolished 
child poverty targets and plans to redefine the remit of the Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree these are retrograde steps designed to mask the fact that the UK Government will be pushing even more children and families into poverty as a result of their austerity-driven policies such as cutting tax credits, cutting employ employment support allowance, imposing the benefit cap and the benefit freeze? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, as members will be aware, the Scottish Government does not support the changes currently being proposed to child poverty legislation under the UK Government's Welfare Reform and Work Bill. I wrote to Ian Duncan Smith last week requesting that he amend the bill to repeal all parts of the 2010 Act imposing any duty on Scottish ministers, including the duty to appoint a commissioner to the new Social Mobility Commission. Scotland already has in place an innovative measurement framework developed in collaboration with the advisory group and set out in the Child Poverty Strategy for Scotland 2014-17, and that addresses the wide range of drivers of poverty as well as the impacts poverty has on the lives of children and their families. We will continue to report against this framework, but will work with stakeholders to build and improve, improve in it. The advisory group's advice and input on Tuesday was a welcome start to these discussions and will continue to be important as we develop a Scottish approach to tacking, tackling child poverty. Question 5, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to promote emergency life support training in school. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. As part of the implementation of the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest strategy, the Government is working with stakeholder organisations to develop ideas and initiatives to increase CPR training. I am pleased that the British Heart Foundation has committed to work with all secondary schools in Scotland by 2020 so that they are equipped to teach CPR and public access defibrillator awareness. Rhoda Grant. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. It is also important, as well as learning CPR, that young people know where to locate an AED, also known as a defibrillator. Many communities in Scotland have fundraised to purchase these AEDs. Can I ask what the Scottish Government are doing to identify the location of all AEDs and ensure that they are all maintained? And given young people's use of modern technology, will they also work with CrowdSav AED, who have an app that you can download onto your mobile phone that will lead you to the nearest AED? Cabinet Secretary. I will certainly look into Rhoda Grant's suggestion. Uh, and as far as the location um, um, issue is concerned, uh, Maureen Watt, Minister for Public Health, uh, is taking forward work around that because it is important to obviously know where uh, the kit is, but also importantly to make sure that those, uh, those uh, who are nearest to those locations uh, who want to be trained are trained and that the, the kit is kept uh, in good order. Um, so I certainly am happy to uh, keep Rhoda Grant informed of that and give her a bit more detail, or I'll ask uh, Maureen Watt to do so and write to her <laughs> with an update. Uh, I should also just finally say that uh, you know, to pay tribute to the communities that have fundraised around this issue, it is a, an important um, addition to the life-saving services that we have within Scotland and uh, communities have gone uh, out of their way to uh, make sure that they can uh, develop um, and uh, um, add to the, the number of defibrillators publicly available, and I would pay tribute to their actions. Question number six, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made with the Scottish Business Development Bank. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, good progress has been made in the establishment of a business development bank, and we will set out the options for how the bank will operate and a timetable for its establishment by the end of this year. As part of the preparations for the establishment of the bank, the programme for government contained a series of new announcements to continue to support SMEs, including launching a new £40 million SME holding fund this autumn to provide investment to SMEs, expanding the provision of specialist financial readiness advice for SMEs, and working with our enterprise agency and local authority partners to simplify how SMEs access finance advice and support. Gavin Brown. Presenting officer, this bank was first announced by the government well over two years ago, so he has an interesting definition of good progress. Uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, um, will the bank be open for business before the dissolution of Parliament? 
well, that, will, th th that will be dependent on the announcements the government makes towards the end of this year, uh, and we will set out all of the detail at that stage. I would have thought this might have been an opportunity for Mr Brown to welcome the launch of the £40 million SME holding fund, which is going to give practical assistance to SMEs in the country, and that is part of the preparations for the delivery of the Scottish Business Development Bank. Version 7, Jackson Carlow. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the recommended routes are for people travelling on public transport from East Renfrewshire to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and how long on average it is anticipated those routes should take. Minister Derek Mackay. Travel Line Scotland provides tailored journey planning for anyone travelling to the Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth University Hospitals. Travel Line information takes account of the individual's point of departure and the time of day when they wish to travel. The information provided to travellers includes available alternatives, along with an estimate of how long any journey will take. In addition, SPT and Greater uh, Glasgow and Clyde Health Board have a great deal of information on their respective websites on how to get to the new hospital. Uh, I thank the Minister for that. Um, there has been a breakthrough of sorts in as much as parts of Eastwood, where I live, in the umpteenth version of the Transport Access Plan have finally appeared, if only in a series of disembodied boxes in the nether regions of the map. Does he appreciate that the primary concern of many regarding the location of the consolidated Glasgow Hospital campus was access to it? And that many in East Renfrewshire, and despite all the years of talking about an integrated transport pathway, feel utterly overlooked. What more can he insist be done to offer practical access for patients and visitors alike? Minister. Well, Mr Carla will be aware that there are a range of options and routes. It's right to say there's no direct route, but between some bus changes and other interchanges, it is possible to get there with times ranging between 40 minutes uh, and I, I respect uh, over uh, an hour. But there is that personalised service there to support individual passengers, as well as the patient uh, transport service as well uh, for patients, and a range of information to support people to make the right public transport connections. Question number eight, James Kelly. To ask the Scottish Government what action has been taken to tackle the shortage in the number of GPs. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Under this government, the number of GPs employed in Scotland has risen by 7% to nearly 5,000, the highest ever on record. We have also increased investment in primary medical services by over £88 million, and there are more GPs per head of population <coughs> in Scotland than in England. However, I recognise that demand is also increasing, and that is why I have recently announced that over the next three years, an additional £50 million will be invested to address immediate workload and recruitment issues including putting in place long-term sustainable change within primary care. James Kelly. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I just hope that the Cabinet Secretary is aware of some of the pressures that local GPs are working under. Uh, last week, one uh, local GP uh, in Rutherglen told me that local GPs were under so much pressure that his colleagues were ruling out uh, working on the out-of-hour service. With them working under so much pressure and strain, uh, particularly in Rutherglen, Cambus, Lang and Blanta, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what practical measures the Government are taking to support local GPs? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I said to James Kelly in my initial answer, that the practical measure we are taking is a £50 million investment over the next three years, and that will do a number of things, um, addressing immediate workload and recruitment issues. Uh, the, specifically, the fund will increase the number of medical students choosing to train as GPs. It will encourage those wanting to work in specifically in deprived areas. And of course, we're going to continue with the enhanced returners programme, supporting GPs who wish to return to the profession and develop a programme for local GP leadership and networking. So James Kelly can be assured that we are taking um, all the action we can in order to address some of the issues that he highlighted. Travis Scott. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned medical students who uh, train in Scotland. Uh, does she, is she aware that 30 per cent of these students currently leave Scotland once they have finished their professional training? And would she look at a requirement that they might stay in Scotland once that training has concluded? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, we are looking at all of those matters. Thank you. That ends general questions. Before we move to First Minister's questions, I am sure members will wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery His Excellency Mr Patrick Engelberg the Ambassador of Luxembourg to the United Kingdom. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question one.